Well, if you looked at the time step index for each of these components in this equation, you'll see we have EZ at time step n plus 1 here. And the HYs are at n plus a half, so that's at a half step earlier in time compared to EZ. And EZ also at time step n. In other words, EZ at n plus 1 is the f component that's farthest out into the future. So if we solve for this term, we may be able to predict the values of EZ at time step n plus 1 using previous values of EZ and HY that should be stored in the computer. Let's see if this is true. Let's solve for the future value of EZ at i and n plus 1. And we can do this by multiplying the entire equation by dt and moving EZ i and n, this term right here, to the other side of the equation over here. If we do all that, we're going to get that this is equal to EZ i at time step n plus dt over epsilon. Here's your epsilon. We also had to divide by epsilon, uh, delta x. And that multiplied by the hy's. All right, so in words, this equation says the future value of EZ at position I is equal to the value of EZ at the same position, but one time step earlier, plus a coefficient times the difference between the two neighboring HYs one half time step earlier. So what this equation turns out to be is an update equation for all the EZ components in our model. So we can repeat this update equation for all the I's positions in our grid, and we can also repeat it over all time steps in our grid. So this is one equation that we want to program into our computer in order to solve for the propagation of electromagnetic plane waves in one dimension. Now, if we're going to be solving this equation over and over again, it's helpful if we don't repeat the exact same calculations over and over again if the answer is not going to change throughout the simulation. For example, to evaluate this equation efficiently, it helps if we don't solve for dt over epsilon delta x over and over and over again every time step and at all positions in space. Since the materials we're modeling for our scenario won't change in time over the time span of interest, this coefficient doesn't change over time. And as a result, it's helpful if we can store the two coefficients, one here and this one right here, before time stepping begins. So we're going to call this one CA, it's just equal to 1, and this one is CB, and it's equal to delta T over epsilon delta X. Now even though CA is just equal to 1 right now, and it seems like we don't need it, I'm going to go ahead and define it, and we'll see later that CA is not always equal to 1. All right, well, we've taken care of Ampere's law, so now spend a minute and see if you can apply central differencing to Faraday's law in the same manner as we just did for Ampere's law. See if you can derive the update equation for the HYs in our discretized grid. So this will be at I plus 0.5 and N plus 0.5 and start from this 1D form of Faraday's law that we came up last time for a Z-polarized wave propagating in the X direction.